It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't f*** it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. What's up, dreamers and creamers? Hope you enjoyed all of your wet dreams over the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I am actually, this is this episode is going to air about a week after Memorial Day, just to let you know, Brett, this is, we're time traveling here in the podcast world, but I am joined today by Brett R. Smith. Now, Brett was introduced to me by a good friend, Remzo Martinez, who, of course, a mutual connection. And uh, Brett's got a fascinating story in... You have worked with quite a few of these very famous comic book companies. He is with Color Fusion Productions and has done work with uh, advertising, with uh, comics you know, from Marvel to Chaos Comics to DC. You name it, you've done it. But also has, uh, I think, now famously been involved with the graphic novel for Clinton Cash. So, Brett, welcome to the show. And I can't wait to talk to you a little bit more about all of this. No, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, so... You know, we're going to get into all that good stuff. But as I mentioned, Brett and I are obviously on Twitter and we interact there. And as you all should and follow both of us on Twitter. But I was joking the other day because I was home with my kids over this long holiday weekend. My wife abandoned me to the wolves to go off and get drunk in Napa Valley at Bottle Rock. And I had been, you know, putting on these various shows, one of which is unfortunately Peppa Pig. Yeah. And I'm sure most people out there are very familiar with Peppa Pig, as horrible as it is. It's one of the most idiotic aggravatingly obnoxious shows and i had tweeted out a picture of one of the dumber episodes which was you know these people this construction bowl building a, a wall across the road right across the road right now it, for what possible reason i don't know but it made me so angry and you would tweet it back well you know stick to 80s cartoon shows and i said yeah, right. that's that's interesting and so tell me why, what your take on 80s cartoon shows, what they bring to the table, especially in our modern times. And I'll tell you some of the ones we've actually started watching with my kid and why I do think it's better. Well, I think, uh, you know, um, to start off with, aesthetically, they look great. They're beautiful. Yeah. They're hand-drawn. Um, most of them were done um, in Japan uh, by, by uh, uh, places like Toei Studios and, and whatnot. Um, the, the Peppa Pig image that you posted just looked awful and i think i, I think i tweeted back you know, i've never seen animation that looks this aesthetically horrible you know it's, it's just it, it's like the it's like this new cow art style that um has come out of you know it's kind of uh, the, the new look of animation is this cow art style and it just looks horrible it's uh, the characters are sort of like have these big eyes and these goofy teeth and um and and it's meant to you know you know again the people in charge who are all on the left they want to make everything look ugly. Therefore, mm. they can have uh, anybody can do it. You know, it doesn't require merit or skill yeah. in order to do this stuff. So when you go back and you look at the 80s cartoons, like I said, which were largely done by Japanese studios, they were written here. They were storyboarded here by Americans. And then you um, which is the same as The Simpsons, everything, uh, all the pre-production writing, the uh, prop design, character design, it's all done here in America, film Roman. And then they ship it off to South Korea to put mm -hmm. together all of the um, the grunt work, which is called in betweens, and it's it's which is animation jargon. It's the same with the the '80s cartoons. Uh, they they were all kind of packaged in America, sent to Japan. Japan ships back 63 episodes of Robotech or um, He Man or He Man was done in America or a Mask or GI Joe, which is probably probably the most famous one that Toby yeah. did. I mean, Rainbow all, Bright. I guess the only ones I've been watching Rainbow Bright. Yeah. You can just tell the you can tell by the style specifically in some of these shows. Like, oh, that's 100 uh, percent Japanese animation style. Yeah. And it's and it's got a different look, obviously, than Disney, and it's and it's animated a little bit different than Disney. But um, you know, they all have a very beautiful, pleasing aesthetic about them in that sense. And it's because they hired the best. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, that that's kind of uh, the mo over there, and it still is. When it, whether it comes to manga, which is the 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 comic books, or whether it's anime, which is the the uh, the, the animated stuff, it's it's got to look good because that's what the audience expects. And you know, whether it's you know, uh, realistic stuff like G.I. Joe or whether it's like the um, the more uh, Hello Kitty, you know, kind of uh, cartoony stuff. It all sort of has a, an aesthetic which is pleasing. And mm -hmm. that's something that's 
been completely abandoned by American animation. Nickelodeon really started it. Um, and, and I think that um, you, you watch those early episodes of The Simpsons on Tracy Ullman, which um, I did back in the day, uh, yeah. you know, on Fox. And it's awful looking stuff. But that's kind of where it started to like drift away from being sort of considered sort of a high art and something that you wanted to look cool to just being something that looks awful, frankly. Yeah. It just, yeah. it's just not fun. The Simpsons has its own look and I like the Simpsons, but, but too many, like if you, if you saw the Thundercats reboot, um, it is just garbage. It's mm. complete garbage in comparison to what Thundercats was, which was done by Rankin Bass. Uh, and I, and I think they use Toei as well, Toei, Toei Studios, but even Spider-Man is an amazing, his amazing friends, um, the Hulk, uh, incredible Hulk cartoon. These were all done. Uh, Marvel packaged them, uh, uh, Sunbeam Productions and packaged mm -hmm. them over Japan. They come back. This is the stuff that we all grew up on, on top of things like um, Battle of Planets, um, Speed Racer, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these some of these 70s cartoons, which were re-edited for American audiences. And that was kind of my introduction to Japanese animation in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, yeah. yeah. It was done in America by Lou Shire, which was... Um, a really, really good um, studio. Lou pretty much created Saturday morning cartoons. He, he basically, he and Hanna Barbera. But um, yeah, it's 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 just a different era, man. You know, it's it's kind of sad. But like, you know, those cartoons were um, not only looked great, but they had great stories, and then they also had great messages. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it's like I remember back in the day where it's like, um, um, you know, you know, now you know, and knowing's half the battle. You know, those little. Right. Those little end cap GI Joe things, you know, where it's like, you know, it's a down. Uh, which which I think the government, the government made them do that, didn't they? I mean, I think that was actually government intervention to say they have to have. You can't just have the violence and the fighting. You have to have something good at the end and a moral, a moral message in kids' cartoon shows. <laughs> that was uh, uh, Mattel actually came up with that idea on their own. Oh, did they? they? But they oh, did it to kind of grease the skids because mm. up until 1980, you couldn't have any kind of real animation um, you couldn't advertise for more than 10 seconds of animation with a commercial. And when Reagan came in, this, this was an old FEC rule. Reagan came in and um, uh, it needed to be renewed. It needed mm -hmm. a signature in order to continue. And uh, he decided not to sign it. So he let it lapse. And that's what gave way to He-Man, which then was a toy, you know, but they needed a way to market it to kids. Yeah. And instead, you know, and, and it's kind of like um, they had the mini comics, which came in the blister packs, and those were done by Marvel. Um, and, and they were actually really, uh, it was Marvel or DC, but like guys like Bruce Timm and, and guys who, who would come to be big comic book artists sort of broke into the industry doing uh, these little mini comics that went into all the He-Man um, uh, action figures. And, and at the time, that was like the shittiest work you could do at Marvel. <laughs> uh, Larry Hama, who, who famously uh, uh, wrote G.I. Joe comic book, which would pr precluded the cartoon. Um, he, he's always said that like nobody wanted to work on the toy stuff. Like you had to be bottom of the barrel. And he's like, I got to sign this. And he's like, I, you know, I just did my best, you know, but um, <laughs> my dog's barking. UPS is here. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, you know, those little um, moral to the stories at the end of the GI Joe stuff. Um, we used to kind of joke about that when we were kids. We we're like, this is so dorky. But now that I go back and I watch them, I'm like, okay, that's not only clever from the standpoint of just, just marketing to parents and letting them see that this isn't all violence. Because I remember no. that was my mom's biggest concern oh, yeah. with whether it was Voltron or G.I. Joe. These are violent and they're going to turn kids violent. Well, um, right. And that was the that was a big political calling card, too, of, you know, the GOP at the time, and, yeah. which is all nonsense. You know, every study is can basically debunk that plus video games. The influence. moral majority. But, yes, exactly. And, and, you know, it's like the moral majority in the PMRC. They had, you know, ties to the left and the right because you had Tipper Gore, you know, mm -hmm. on the PMRC. They're the ones that stuck warning labels on all of our albums. Um, but the moral majority, yeah, they, you know, and, and, and you know, He-Man was very much reined in from the standpoint of violence because in the comic books, um, the, the mini comics, he was much more of a barbarian, kind of like Conan. And he did live on Eternia, but it was much more, he, there was no Prince Adam, you know, there wasn't this, uh, you know, uh, dual identity. Skeletor was a really bad guy and it was more about the power sword. Uh, and if you remember the power sword, there was two pieces of the power sword. He-Man had one piece, Skeletor had the other. Mm -hmm. And if you put them together, you could click them together and stick that into the keyhole at Castle Grayskull, then the jaw bridge would come down and then you would have access to all the mysteries and the power of 
of, of Castle Grayskull. By the power of Grayskull. Yes. So Skeletor, <laughs> that was kind of his whole thing, was to capture this, the other half of the sword from He-Man. And it was much more violent, much more um, kind of sword and sorcery in the comic books. So when Lou came along, and uh, originally they wanted to do a two-hour special, and he said, well, you know, for the same amount of money, I can give you 63 episodes, you know, which is just enough to keep his entire staff working for a year. <laughs> right. You know? Uh, <laughs> and, and like, so they had to really kind of change it in order to meet the the tv standards and the censors and all this stuff so most a lot of the action was taken out in fact there was one story where he-man rips a tree out of the ground and uh, the censors had a big issue with this and they're like oh you can't do that and they're like yeah but why well, like, and this is way before earth day existed what the hell way before <laughs> uh this is this is when chlorofluorocarbons were you know were just starting to be introduced right. to be bad for the environment spray paint and hairspray and such uh staples of the 80s um but like you know so they had to change that. It's like, well, little boys are going to go outside and tear trees out of the ground. It's just like if we had, if that's our biggest problem as a country, right? Is if little boys had the strength to tear trees out of the ground, what a hell of a, a, a warrior generation we'd be. But, Another but I mean, reason the eighties were better. We had, we had children trying to rip trees out of the ground. Well, yeah, I mean, boys were far more rowdy back then than, than they no. are today. That's for sure because they were we weren't we weren't treated as like malfunctioning little girls. Right. You yeah. Know? We weren't told it was toxic. It was just understood that boys will be boys. Right. And you well, can always say boys will be boys. And you and I had like four times the amount of recess. So we were yeah. able to go out and burn all that energy off, you know, like probably two or three times, uh, you know, out of the day. And, um, you know, it makes a big difference. Um, plus all of the, you know, tons of activities that I was involved in, you know, judo and karate and all kinds of stuff back in the day. I mean, that was kind of the thing. Your parents kept you busy. They kept you burnt out basically you know 100 percent. well there's the, there's the, the joke point. too about you know the time being being raised very differently and i was just looking at some meme that i saw where it's you know at these at times people will go home from school and they'd say okay you know the parents know where you're at they know what you're doing they're they're you know very on top of it and in the meantime when we grew up it was like they didn't realize school would be out you know you'd yeah. you'd be home yeah you know, they wouldn't realize that school had already ended for uh for a week and they're like why are you home yeah. like, oh school's school's over Right. I guess you haven't seen it because I've been running around outside without your knowledge, but I'm home when it gets dark, you know, like hey, there's a certain time you're yeah. home for dinner and that's when, it. And otherwise there's no supervision. Be home when, 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 when the streetlights come on. Right. Exactly. You know, or, exactly. or, or which I had forgot about, there were PSAs that ran in the seventies and the eighties, which would say parents it's nine o'clock. Right. Do you know where your children are? I mean, our parents didn't know where they we were. Because they didn't yeah. care. They were just like, ah, oh, he's out there somewhere. Like, right. He'll know, be fine. Yeah, the, it'll be the fine. Gen Xers, the Gen Xers are the, um, and early millennials, um, are the least nurtured. Uh, we had the least amount of adult supervision. We were, we grew up a lot faster, which is why we're called latchkey kids. Because yep. we would come home. Nobody would be there usually. So we kept a key tied to a string around our neck. Um, yeah, my, I mean, it was, was, when you think about it. It was really, honestly, a lot of that too is also the the kind of the first real huge wave of a generation of women that were now part of the the full time workforce. Divorce. So, yeah, well, divorce and also just cost of living increases. Where you know, it's there's always that yeah. argument whether or not the feminist revolution was good or bad for you know not only America but women because mm -hmm. it basically allowed for prices to be increased. It, it demanded that women go to the workforce because our wealth has been robbed from us from right. all the inflationary practices that have undertaken it. So whether or not we women wanted to go to work, they probably would have been forced to regardless. So we, we have, as a result, we're latchkey kids. And I was a latchkey yeah. kid. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, you either come home and your old, my, my older brother might've been there or maybe a housekeeper, but she wasn't there mm -hmm. for very long. So it's like, you just kind of park yourself in front of the TV and I would turn it on and watch G.I. Joe, Robotech, yep. Masters of the Universe, Voltron, Silverhawks, Thundercats. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these were after school shows. Some of them would air in the morning uh, and then some of them would also be on um, on Saturdays. But these are mainly Monday through Friday shows. Yep. Um, and um, these were all toy, you know, these were all toy companies that had, you know, come up with ideas in house and they were looking for a way to market it. So for, the, for example, you know, Masters of the Universe and G.I. Joe, they originally reached out to DC and Marvel and they started a comic book series. And um, and then at that point, it's kind of like um, I remember Mattel. Mattel had gotten into Children's Palace, which was like the second largest toy retailer next to Toys R Us with mm -hmm. G.I. Joe. And they wanted to expand. So it was kind of like, OK, 
uh, they go and they pitch his Toys R Us. Well, how are you going to market this? You know, you got this comic, but these toys are for five and up and five-year-olds don't read. And, yeah. and so, so the guy from Mattel is kind of, you know, pulls it out of his ass. He's like, Oh, didn't, didn't I mention we're going to be doing like a, a, a cartoon for this? And they're like, <laughs> really a cartoon? Yeah. Yeah. 22 minutes every day. So, okay, great. So, um, it, it was the same with He-Man. It was the cartoon, which got them into, um, bigger markets. Mm -hmm. uh, basically. And that was the idea. So it's, you know, these, and this didn't really dawn on to me until I think I was in my thirties that these cartoons were not the cartoons for cartoons sake. These cartoons yeah. were to sell toys. Yeah. But it's such a deft idea because, you know, the, the figures for all these things, the action figures were kind of like lost leaders, you know, somewhere around five to $7 a piece. GI Joe's were about four ninety nine back in the day. It's the vehicles. That's where they make their money. Yeah. Whether it's the the Sky Striker or you know the uh, um, uh, you know the Mobile Command Center or the GI Joe headquarters or the um, uh, the Cobra Rattler, which was the I think everybody's introduction to the A10 Thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. um, you know this was th this was kind of the idea was okay. You know we'll get them to spend a little bit of money, five ten bucks on these figures, and then we'll make our money on these vehicles, which are probably $20 and up. Yeah. The birthday and the Christmas presents and the, right. the rich kids get them all the time. But well, and the I, rich kids, the rich I, kids. I just save up my allowance. I don't even know if kids have allowance anymore. If they do that, or if they just give them well, a credit well, card and you, tell them to go crazy. You probably mention that an allowance was through the yield of your labor doing. Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And yeah. that's was the same with me. I had chores that I had to do it. I would, I, there wasn't any question whether or not I would do them. It's just that my parents threw in five bucks every week. Right. You know, and I take <laughs> that money and I'd go to mile high comics or I'd go to all about books and comics and I would blow it all every month. Or, you know, you go to the toy store and you know, you, you bring a little bit of your own money and then you and I convince my dad to kick in a little bit more and get me yeah. something else or get me something bigger, you know, but that, that was kind of the idea behind these cartoons. And, you know, they were all, exclusively marketed to boys, young boys, you know, probably five and up, you know, and, and you're probably into that stuff from probably somewhere between four five and nine, 10, 11, you know, and then you start to get interested in other things. Um, um, but, but, you know, unlike today, um, these things were specifically made for boys for that demographic. That is a long abandoned demographic. Mm -hmm. Nobody makes anything for boys anymore. Um, they just expect to make kind of this innocuous crap that's meant for boys and girls. And then they make right. a lot of stuff for girls, too. And and you and, and it's basically seen in just the lack of the fact that there is no G.I. Joe. You know, there is no Masters of the Universe. None of these franchises have continued on. My Little Pony's there and, you know, and, and, and other girl Barbie and, you know, other other girls uh, lines, which were produced back then are still here today. But, um, you know, the idea that you want to make heroic masculine tough guy uh characters and franchise you know build franchises around you know tough men you know like duke and flint mm -hmm. uh you know and and uh, and he-man and uh Lionel. um that's that's just gauche now and it's also sexist and and yeah. you know it's toxic masculinity and where where it's like you know i think that all that stuff because of all of those morals and those little end cap uh, you know, knowing is half the battle. And even He-Man had those little PSAs at the end of each one. Um, you know, it's like I said, when I look at them now, I'm just kind of like, that's good stuff. And, you know, yeah. you know, if, if you don't have a dad around all the time, you know, maybe, maybe you see your dad on the weekends or maybe you see your dad like me, um, you know, for three months out of the year in the summertime. If there's no male figure or masculine figure in your household, if it's just you and your single mom, these characters they were all your surrogate dads and, and Adam West uh, who played Batman in the 60s series had said uh, one time that, um, you know, one of the things that was, that would always happen to him when he would go and do signings at conventions was people would come up to him, you know, different generations. Cause that's a show that I watched in syndication, mm -hmm. but, but boys would always, or, you know, grown men would always come up to him and say, I was a boy. And my dad left us or my, you know, we were divorced and I only saw my dad a little bit out of the year and you were my dad. You imparted wisdom and knowledge to me when, when my dad wasn't there and it wasn't, you know, maybe you would have gotten that from your dad. Maybe you wouldn't have, maybe, you know, I, I got a lot of that stuff from my dad, but I also heard it repeated through these characters. Mm -hmm. And I just think to myself, how fortunate that I was to be that age and that target demographic of all of those toy companies, because what they made 
was really great and really fantastic and I think really healthy. And, um, you know, it molded me into the guy I am today, not only from the standpoint of who I am and my moral, my ethos, but also what I ended up doing as far as my career. And, and I've yeah. gotten to meet some of those guys, uh, like Flint Dilly, who wrote Transformers the movie and wrote season oh, nice. helped write I just watched that recently, oddly enough. But it's so funny because, like, he's the guy who uh, was part of the, the decision to kill Optimus Prime, which was had nothing to do with killing Optimus Prime so much as it was to, we got to get rid of all these Generation 1 characters so we can right, introduce exactly. all these new ones because we need the kids to go buy this stuff. Exactly. Well, it's interesting too. You you mentioned the fact that we were latchkey kids, and often that was what we did when we got home. I had the same same exact experience, same exact cartoons, same exact thing. But this generation that did say, "Okay, well, we've got these characters, we've got these morals, we've got this these values being taught to us," and very much do the right thing. Um, that heroic male character of I'm going to stand up for what's right. I'm going to stand up for you know to protect women, protect children, protect my household, my family, my friends, etc. And I think there's something to be said for the fact that now. There are probably more families, and I know for a fact there are more children out there that do not have fathers around. You know, this has been a movement that's been gaining steam, that it's been gaining and accelerating throughout the last few decades. So there's more people in need of that father figure, that moral uh, leadership. And yet, as we're talking about, the cartoons don't embody that anymore. It's all very kumbaya. There's not really strong male characters. There's not really that that portrayal of what the prototypical male do the right thing male is any right. longer it's been removed from our society and i think at another level too when you talk about how things interact there is much less emphasis on simply that playing with toys as you did i had all the gi joes all the transformers i'd have epic battles you know yeah. in my room you know just alone the tv wouldn't mm -hmm. even be on playing with the toys and now using that's been your imagination using, using my imagination. Your imagination right and and now that's yeah. been abdicated because now it's all video games or non-stop you yeah. know entertainment all the time like and i will say it gives me joy when my daughter goes and plays in the other room with her dollhouse or her toys and she's yeah. young she's three and a half but i'm like thank god i'm very excited for this you know but it it is amazing how we're getting away from that and i do think that it's a great loss for creativity and for instilling that that leadership, that guidance that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think I think I think a lot of that wisdom that I got from that from those cartoons was also stuff that my grandfather taught me as well. Because mm -hmm. you got to remember who's writing this stuff back then. It's largely boomers or guys in their twenties, um, so they might have been sort of on the cusp of uh, boomer Gen X or sort of in that weird sixty to 60, 1964 sort of window. I don't really consider them boomers. Because mm -hmm. they're so much like us. They're just kind of like older Gen Xers. But you've got those 65 to 75 Gen Xers. And then you've got me, the, you know, kind of the uh, the 76 to 80, you know, sort of, uh, or, or I guess it would be uh, 66 to 80. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of two subsets of Gen Xers. And I think that, you know, we got all of our wisdom from the World War II generation, which was our grandparents, and the boomers who, mm -hmm. um, you know, grew up in the 50s and had that leave it to beaver, you know, kind of lifestyle and, and was the first generation to have discretionary income, you know, so we're that we're kind of like that second generation that they wanted to go out and sort of mine and pick their pockets and get their yeah. allowances. But, you know, you know, you know, to their credit, they created great stuff for us. And I think that, you know, part of that, they, they understood that they had to get past the parents. You know, they had to get approval of the parents for this stuff. And G.I. Joe, you look at that stuff. Um, I inherited my brother's stuff, the 12 inch dolls, which were, oh, wow. uh, you know, the World War Two and the yeah. Vietnam era and whatnot. And then it kind of turned into this thing called adventure uh, action adventure force or something. Um, but like if you look at our three, three and three quarter inch G.I. Joe's, the detail of the weapons you know i mean and and they're you know, magnificent these, man they're beautiful they're so beautifully sculpted um but but i mean let's you know make no mistake you know these are they're action figures these are men of action you know you're supposed to play war with them and when they originally created gi joe the the second incarnation in the 80s they didn't have uh, a um a villain and when marvel comics uh had their meeting with them jim shooter somebody said Okay, well, who's um, maybe Larry Hama said it. He said, "Who's GI Joe supposed to fight?" And the, the you know the Hasbro guys were like, uh, "I don't know. You know, they'll, <laughs> they'll fight the Star Wars. They'll fight their Star Wars figures, or they'll fight their their chips figures, or whatever." You know, and they're like, "That that doesn't work." I'm like, "You you guys you guys need to create like four four villains, 
and and then and then you can start creating some uh, uh, vehicles for them as well. So they're like, well, okay, fine. You know, what do you have in mind? And and I think it was Archie Goodwin who's like a who who passed away a couple of years ago. One of the longtime you know great old gunslinger editors over at Marvel said, "Why doesn't GI Joe just fight Cobra?" <laughs> and everybody's like, "That sounds pretty awesome." Okay, you know. So then <laughs> you know Hasbro comes with up that great you know Cobra, oh, the um, iconic logo, yeah, you know, with mm. the, the, the the snake and the oh, fangs. Of course. And then you know it's like you know I think it was Cobra Commander, Destro, and then you had the. Um, uh, just there, the Cobra like, soldier, you know, the, with the black, yeah. the black mask. Yeah, um, and I think you had Baroness too. So, so Baroness, like, that's what I was trying to think. Of. Who was hot, by the she way? Was. They, she they was. did not shy away from making the uh, the female characters hot because you could it's still true. do that, and not have people lose their minds. It's true. Uh, even even the, the the guy that designed them said, you know, between Baroness and Lady J, he gave them yep. uh, low yep. cut, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, necklines in order to just to add a little bit of sex appeal. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and it's like you know, when you're a kid that age. It appeals to you, but you don't quite know why those those synapses haven't quite, you know, connected. But instinctually, you're like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And it was the same with Tila. I always thought Tila was such a babe. And and if you just look at her curves, she's got this great hourglass. She's not mm -hmm. huge. She doesn't have like <laughs> D's or anything like that. But she's, you know, these these were like athletic women of action. And of course, we grew sure. up on a lot of those too. Whether it was um, Linda Carter. Chitara, I mean, look, I'll say Chitara it for, was great. Yes. So hot. So, so such hot. a lady of action. Does that, I mean, does that make me a furry? You know, I, no, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't say no to it, but right. yeah, I mean, right. but it's like, but it was understood, you know, that it's like, look, women are sexy. And there was, there was a recent thing. I don't know if you saw this with video games where some female, you know, feminist organization, women in games came out and said, Hey, stop making all the women so hot in gaming. And it's just like, okay, now we got to have you know, we got to have chunk checks walking around in the video you know, games. Yes. Like, can we acknowledge that sexuality does have a role and that these are video game characters. They're allowed to be, you know, dream versions. It's kind of like the modeling industry. It's supposed to be this unattainable ideal for a reason. And to simply dumb it down takes part of the allure away from it. And well, it takes and, part of that goal chasing away from it. And part of human nature. I mean, you want to reject hundreds of thousands of years of cultures right. celebrating not only beauty, but youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, give me a break. You wouldn't have a renaissance without that. You know, yeah. that's that's part of where art comes from is celebrating <laughs> the human form, but especially celebrating <laughs> beauty. Yeah. Um, Can we get a fatter Vino de Milas? De Milas Vino de wait, Vino de Milas. But no, it's I'm this, fucking that up. <laughs> but it's this idea, again, that we're going to make everything. Venus ugly. de Milo. There Venus we go. Milo. Sorry, my brain sketched out for a minute there. No, All right. Sorry. Called, it's called a middle-aged moment, dude. Oh yeah. God, I know. And, and after being up at five a.m. the last, you know, seven days with my children. All right, sorry. Go ahead. I don't have kids, and I'm up that early. So God damn it, I get it. I get it, dude. <laughs> but but you know, I think the left want to, in a sense, and especially the cultural Marxists, they hate beauty. They hate standards. You know, you're healthy at any size. Um, you know, you know, these things are all about, um, in a lot of ways, demoralization. You know, you want to mm -hmm. you want to you want to chip away at the things that are um, inherently American, uh, yes. whether whether it's Bud Light or whether it's um, Coles or whether it's G.I. Joe, whether it's Transformers. You know, Transformers has now jumped onto the bandwagon of uh, they have a um, I think a, a, a non-binary Transformer. Of, of you know, and what's funny Why about Transformers is, is that, you know, um, you know, just like with Roadblock in G.I. Joe, who was one of my favorite characters, you know, big black guy, bald mm -hmm. mustache. He's got the huge Ma Deuce that he just walks around with, just gunning, gunning Cobra soldiers down. Um, you know, I mean, I, I didn't need to identify with those characters or I think they're awesome because we had different skin color. Yeah. You know, I saw myself in those characters or parts of myself or part of who I wanted to be. And it was had nothing to do with their skin color. You know, um, and it's the same with the Transformers. You know, I didn't need to identify skin color or tone to see myself in Optimus Prime or Bumblebee. I wanted to be Optimus Prime, mm. you know, um, you know, and, and that's kind of what's so ridiculous about this stuff is that, you know, our generation, I guess, was the last to be taught that it's about content of character. Yep. And, and the, the exterior, you know, also don't judge a book by its cover. That was drilled into us. Also, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You know, right. from the great Frank Zappa, he used to, you know, uh, pre preach very poetically, uh, George Carlin as well, about how ridiculous it is that we're offended by words. And now, mm -hmm. you know, it's like today, words are, words hurt. 
Yeah. You know, they hurt people. And this generation wuss, which uh, Brett Easton Ellis, uh, you know, dubbed is a very real thing. And, it, and you don't have to be a millennial. You don't have to be a Gen Zer or whatever um, or a Gen Xer. You know, if, you know, if, if you're easily offended by words and what and you give people the power over you to make those words mean something, you're generation wuss. Right. Exactly right. Um, you know what? I I was going to say, uh, also, Ricky Gervais has been fantastic on commenting about this. I don't know if you followed him, but, you know, he's got yeah. some great quotes about, you know, in what world do you think that you deserve to go around and, and just be offended by everything and then censor my speech because of it? You know, how, right. how the gall of you. But right. um, right. Absolutely. I, I think I think it's insane. Um, you know, and, and I just it's just weird that like these things that we were taught were seem to be very common sense and they empowered us. And I think that they better protected us and, um, you know, they prepared us for the world that we were going out into where we wouldn't have our folks around. And I think that maybe because our folks weren't around to begin with as much and we were sort of, we weren't helicopter parented. Maybe that's why they imparted that wisdom, but that wisdom also came from my grandparents but it was all about empowering. And now it's all about empowering victimhood. You know, exactly. it's, like, it's like we were imparted with empowering in like survival skills. And like, you know, you know, it, it's a jungle out there. Remember when we used to, be, we used to yeah. say that? I love that. I love that saying. And Mr. Mom, when when Terry Dar is about <laughs> to go out the door, you know, and uh, and one of the kids is like, Mom, she's like, yeah, He's, she's like, it's it's a jungle out there. And like she looks at Michael Keaton. And, and, he's, and she's like, very funny. He's like, I, where does he get this? I don't know where he gets, this. but it's, but it's like, it's like, that was, uh, that was some, that was a modicum that was used because it was true. It's a tough world, man. Right. And, and you got to be tough too. And you've got to be tougher than the other guy in order to get it done and to make something of yourself and make your mark and kick ass out there. I don't know what these parents are telling these kids these days, but I think getting back to, you know, kind of where we started in this conversation, I think that if you, reject all of the modernity out there from the standpoint of children's entertainment. I think that's the best way you can go. And there's so much of this stuff that we've been talking about, whether it's Thundercats, G.I. Joe, uh, Mask was another one that I just loved. Um, there's so much of this stuff which is free on apps mm -hmm. like Pluto TV and Freebie and, um, and elsewhere that I, if I had kids, uh, I would feed them nothing but 80s cartoons, 80s entertainment, probably some 70s stuff, too, because there's yep. some very good stuff in the 70s. Schoolhouse rock. Um, you know, all these things were meant to make us smarter and better and inform us. And I look at the stuff today and I'm just like, they're just creating victims. And it's right. all about, you know, bifurcating everybody into camps and groups. Oh, you're special. And you go over here with this group and you're special. And everybody's special you know yeah. if everybody's special nobody's special well it's unfortunately there is still obviously a lot of capitalism behind with the content that's created with cartoons but there is now as you said it's interesting to see that a lot of the content that was created in the past by capitalism right by capitalist organizations trying to sell toys turns mm -hmm. out to be better more morally coherent than this this utter shit that's coming out now that's been captured by yeah. progressive ideologies by you know marxist ideologies in many cases and as you said which 100 is divisive that's interesting. Now what, that's, that's a great point, because in order to sell a lot of toys and get parents to empty their pockets, it's like I said, you've got to get their approval, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, Hasbro, Mattel, you know, all, all of you know, Hasbro, especially, gosh, I mean, they, they're totally in with all of the the the, the race equity and inclusion yep. stuff. Um, back then, the idea for all American brands, I don't care what it was, was don't get into that. Mm -hmm. You know, you never talk about sex. You never talk about religion. You never talk about politics because Race, you want to know even, why. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, other than, other than, again, ignore the color of the skin. Everybody's equal. That was it. You we know? want meat in the seats. We want to sell as many units as possible. The only way you do that is by staying out of that stuff. So everyone becomes a demographic. Now it's about chopping up the audience, bifurcating the audience, alienating the audience, mm -hmm. pissing it off to appease this tiny, tiny minority. And, and again, it's all about demoralization. If you can destroy American brands, what makes people want to fight for right. those brands or for America in general? Okay. That's what it's really about. And I didn't really get it maybe until a couple months ago, because I could not put, I'm just kind of like, why, why, why do they think this works? And mm -hmm. it's a bunch of, you know, Ivy League, 
high degree assholes in, in the marketing departments and who are running these companies. And they're so far removed from the original owners. They have no, you know, they don't own any of the company like the original owners did, the yeah. founders. Um, they have no um, incentive to carry on a legacy from the standpoint of being an American brand and a brand that's associated with America, Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. Bud Light, GI Joe, Transformers, Disney. right? Yep. Disney, you know, um, you know, so, so they're listening to all of these high degree schmucks who are basically all radically left political activists. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's, you know, when, when you, you subvert these companies from within, um, and, and people have negative reactions to it, you know, it's demoralizing. It sucks. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it hurts because these are things that we love, that we grew up loving and it's why they do it. But, you know, the, the goal is to tear it down, destroy it and build back better, mm -hmm. reconstruct it in, in your own twisted ideological way. And then if you, you and me, when we don't love it and cherish it like the original, we're bigots, we're fascists, mm -hmm. we're Nazis, we're racists, we're white supremacists, we're toxic ma males, you know? And my, you know, my answer to those people is fuck you. Yeah. You know, fuck you. Uh, this is, this is war. And, and, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, I, I want to fight for America, you know, in the same way that I want to fight for these brands and for these IPs. And I don't want to abandon them because, um, just as they were subverted and torn down and destroyed, they can all come back, you know, it, you know, just as strong, if not stronger than before. Um, they can it, be. It, well, it, but it, they can be if they're but they're going to have to be forced to. And at this point, Absolutely. it looks like kicking and screaming. And we have to overcome, obviously, the infiltration of BlackRock. We have to overcome the infiltration of the financing model that's propping these companies up. And it's also that's why said, they I do think, it. That's why oh, they do oh, it. They, if they can't lend money from yeah. certain banks, you know, they're done, you know. Exactly. I mean, and I think that's kind of where the arm twisting comes in, along with having to hire people who also agree with this stuff, who, you know, are, are you know, these people that work at Target and these people that are working at Hasbro, um, you know, you'd find them in a BLM rally. You, you know, yeah. you, you'd find them, you know, among Antifa. I mean, I mean, they are that radical. The editorial at Marvel Comics, which is largely all white liberal women. Um, it's it's insane, you know, and, and it's kind of like a character of itself at this point. You know, they all look the same. All these yep. women, you know, with their, hor you know, the horn rim glasses and their purple <laughs> hair. And yep, their totally. Tops. You know, it's just it's a joke. And they're, half their head is shaved. I mean, yeah. Well, we yeah. got we, well. We could talk about this. We already got like forty minutes. We haven't even gotten into Clinton cash, which we have to talk about. But I will say Sorry. this though, to, <laughs> just to, just to wrap up this this part of the conversation is, I have with my three and a half year old now. We we pretty much we'll watch some new stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there's a cartoon show called Bluey, which is now very famous. Yeah. It is a wonderful show. I was going to mention that there's it's not all crap out there. I, I've got no. a red got a red healer on the other side of the store. So oh, I'm there very, you go. Yeah. Very partial to Australian cattle dogs. It's the greatest breed ever. Um, and I think it was, I think it was road warriors probably where I first saw my first. Oh yeah, man. First Love blue it. healer. But bluey apparently is fantastic. My girlfriend's told me yes. it's really popular. It's really wholesome. Um, it is, it is back to, and a lot of the episodes, I'll tell you this because there's reason I watch it. It is very much back to uh, old school. It's non-divisive. It's not, yeah, it's not race baiting bullshit. And it's very much also, Hey, toughen up. There's a lot of toughen up buttercup stories in there. And wow. one I'll give you an example of is they play this game called Pass the Parcel, which is like a birthday kids game. And, and it's a real, real pussified version that gets introduced to the kids where every kid unwraps it and they all get a prize. But the one dad goes, that's not how the way you play it. Let me show you. Here's how we used to play it. And the only one kid wins. So mm -hmm. there's some tears. But then the kids realize this is much better. Because not everybody wins. That's the excitement of it, is that not everybody wins. And you learn to deal with disappointment, right? You're growing. There's right. you're, growth in the game. So yeah. we watch Cause, that. Because you're uncomfortable. And the only time you're going to have growth is typically when you're uncomfortable. Exactly. So I just kind of have to remind myself when I get uncomfortable. I'm kind of like, oh, wait, this is a growing experience. So, right, yeah. you know, <laughs> so something good can come out of it. You know, and I, th I think it was uh, John Adams said, you know, every problem is an opportunity in disguise. Yep. But, yeah, uh, but that's exactly. interesting because I see the same thing with uh, Cobra Kai 
Um, I see a lot of traditional American values and kind of toughen up. That's the only show out there right now, which openly lampoons the left mm -hmm. and mocks the left. And there, and there, and there are lefty kind of characters in the show that they mock. Yeah. Um, jo Johnny certainly does. But I think that when, I think that when you want to make money, uh, whether you're a corporation or you're trying to tell a story, uh, you know, movies, animation, or even graphic novels and comics, you always go back to traditional American values because that's where the money is, you know, um, you know, that, you know, I, you know, you want to get to that Chip and Joanna audience, uh, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, that big blue ocean out there that just wants entertainment and uh, traditional American values, because those are the things which still ring true to people uh, in a way that's common sense. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not so common anymore. So I think when people hear it, they love it. And I, and I think that was the same with, you know, Top Gun Maverick. I mean, it was so apolitical, you know, yep. it was political. In a yeah, lot of exactly. Ways, That's well said. Exactly right. Well, let's talk. So talking politics, let's yeah. do the last 20 minutes on Clinton Cash, because you had been approached to do the Clinton Cash graphic novel. Right. And this, you know, your involvement in this had, you know, really upset the apple cart in many ways. It really, uh, yeah. I think, you know, encouraged a lot of people to disregard your history, working relationships, your talent, et cetera. So tell us a little bit about how that came about and the reaction and then where you, you know, wh what you found yourself within this comic landscape now mm -hmm. and what you think has become of the, <laughs> the world and what might, and what the future holds. Cause there yeah. are some, some very bright glimpses of potential out there um, oh, yeah. from some notable names. Yeah. 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 The indie market is just exploding. Yeah. Like, like I've never seen before. Um, I, I came into the business in the nineties with chaos comics, which was an independent publisher. And the, 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 you know, the, the industry was really hot on bad girls back then, the bad girl craze. Mm -hmm. And so lady death and she guys like Billy Tucci and Brian Polito with chaos comics, they were out selling Marvel. They were selling 4 million copies of these, of these comic books. And the collector market was very strong back then. It was still in grocery stores. You could still buy comic books you know, on the newsstand, um, mm -hmm. it, it was before it became sort of more of a, a boutique uh, industry where you have to go to the comic book store to buy a comic book, which is retarded. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the industry shrunk quite a bit since then. And, the de and they've kind of kept the sort of writing for the same demographic for a long time, too. They haven't really shifted back to younger readers, strangely enough, um, mm -hmm. because there's a big market there. Obviously, there's a big vacuum there, especially for boys. But um I worked, uh, I was a colorist for Marvel and DC Comics for uh, 26 years and um, did a lot of work for other publishers as well. But I worked on Superman and Batman and Avengers, um, uh, Captain America, all, you know, a lot of the big ones. I think the biggest one I ever worked on was the relaunch of Superman uh, for the new 52 in 2011. And that's when they mm. relaunched everything from issue one and Superman uh, famously uh, did not have red tights anymore. So that was kind of, you know, and that was sort of like right on the heel of Man of Steel. I remember when, yeah. when my issues were coming out, it was really exciting because Man of Steel was about to come out. And we were sort of coordinating in a way with Zach to not... Um, not give too much away as the character design, but yeah, try to get not, it out there kind of thing. It was good and bad because because our writer, George Perez, uh, the late, great George Perez, was very much hemmed in as to what he could do. We had a great creative team, a great art team. It's a beautiful book, but we had this very small box that we could operate in. And we knew very little about Zach, what Zach was doing with Man of Steel. So it was very secret. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, I, I colored for years. I also worked in advertising, doing storyboards. And um, uh, uh, my, 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 my girlfriend at the time was writing for Breitbart. And mm -hmm. I did a, uh, she wrote this uh, article called Political Punks. And it was talked about, you know, uh, a creative artists like Clint Eastwood, Greg Gutfeld, and now Gavin McGinnis, these guys who kind of cut against the cultural grain on the on the right mm -hmm. um, and why they're interesting and why they're kind of our best hope, you know, to save the culture. And um, so I did this graphic. I took I took this Ramon, the, the first Ramones album cover, and I photoshopped Clint Eastwood on, on Joey and Greg and Gavin and Ann Coulter. And it's mm -hmm. it, it's pretty cool. But anyway, uh, Steve Bannon saw it. And he liked it. And um, she uh, recommended me to Steve to do some graphic work for Breitbart. Steve was like, you know, I don't have the budget to do that, but I do have a project you might be interested in. So um, uh, I, I met with his um, his kind of second in command guy, Dan Fluett. And um, he said, we've got the graphic rights to Clinton Cash. And I was just kind of like, oh, OK, you know, 
so what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, you know, he's like, well, it was, a, it was a New York times bestseller, you know, you know, and um, it's this crazy story about, you know, how the Clintons uh, basically, uh, you know, profited off their connections and their influence. And he said, he said, it's a crazy book, dude. He said, you know, you know trust me. And so um, I was just kind of like, okay, well, what do you want to do with this thing? You know? And, and they were, they were just kind of like, we don't know. That's why we're talking to you, you know, you go figure that out if you're interested. So um, I reached out to Chuck Dixon, who um, is probably one of the, probably one of the best Batman writers of all time. He uh, created the, the Batman villain Bane. Uh, oh, nice. along with Graham Nolan. Um, and um, Chuck also had a real famous run uh, with Punisher War Journal uh, back in the 80s. Um, Chuck's got more scripts published than Stan Lee. I mean, he's he's kind of the, in a lot of ways, he's sort of the John Milius of of, of comics. He, he writes for men. Um, he doesn't write he for He didn't do the scenes. Punisher Wolverine crossover issue when Wolverine number three, right? Uh, I own that. I, uh, I I I owned it. I hope I still own it. If because I used to have a Jim, comic Jim book, a box art. of them. Oh, I know, I know, yeah. man. I loved it. I, I that was one I held on to because I used to have a ton of comics and I purged many that were worthless. I, I and I think it's still at my parents' house in Florida. Fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hope so. Yeah, those things are starting to be worth money. You know, the the seventy stuff they're, is worth they're money surging now. again. Yeah, yeah, and now you know it's it's just the collector market. It's it just takes time. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, Chuck's Chuck's definitely prolific in that sense, but he's also worked on The Simpsons. He's worked on uh, the comics, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. He's done a lot of stuff. And one of the things that uh, attracted me to Chuck was he uh, he was already blacklisted from Marvel for his politics. And um, he had, uh, so and, and he was o an open conservative, didn't care, you know, and um, he had also adapted Amity Schley's The Forgotten Man into a graphic novel. Um, uh, Paul Reboche was his artist on that. And that was a New York times number one bestseller. And that's an extremely boring book. I mean, I mean, it is, it is so unbelievably boring, but Chuck was able to take something about the great depression and turn it into something that was entertaining. And with Paul's beautiful artwork, it's, it's, um, very enjoyable to read. So I just kind of figured, okay, that's the guy, that's mm -hmm. the guy I've got to get. And if I can get him, then I'll do this. So I reached out to Chuck and I said, okay, these guys came to me. They've got the graphic rights in cash. We can do whatever we want. Okay. But I'm kind of thinking satire because I had mm -hmm. just been watching Dr. Strange love and I had just wrapped up uh, watching the Sopranos for the first time. I, I missed it when it was on. I, I did too. I watched it after the fact. I usually watch everything after the fact, like succession. I'm not going to watch. Maybe I'll watch it. You know, I now. catch, <laughs> I've caught, I, I, sometimes I catch things really. I caught Cobra Kai years before anybody watched. I, I, yeah. I subscribed to YouTube red in order to oh, watch really? it. Okay? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, nobody even knows that YouTube read, read anymore because it I, re I recall it. I recall it had exclusive content for a very short time. They got time, rid yeah. of it because it didn't yeah. work for them. But um, yeah. And, and then I started watching Yellowstone really early on too, which, you know, now, 20 million people tune into, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a modern Dallas, uh, very much. Um, it's kind of the brilliance of Taylor, what he did, it took something that was already successful and just kind of respun it in his own way. But, um, I, I you know, I got, I got a hold of Chuck and I just said, I, I think we should do something with humor. And I like the humor that the first three seasons of Sopranos has it's satirical and the kids are home. It's like this sitcom almost. And there's this, mm -hmm. there's a lot of fun, uh, in the dialogue. And I said, I, I think if we kind of play it straight, um, but still have humor. I think that's the best way to go. And Chuck just said, no, he goes, I've got it. He goes, we go full national lampoon on the Clintons. <laughs> we make this book page by page, something that you would read and experience with the seventies national lampoon. Uh, uh, you know, when Doug Kenny and Henry Beard were the original guys, uh, that, 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 uh, came out of Harvard, the Harvard lampoon started the national lampoon with Maddie Simmons. I encourage everybody to see the documentary drunk stoned, brilliant dead. It's all about the lampoon hmm. and you'll see who taught Gen X humor very much because all of the talent that came to Saturday night live in 1980 was basically stolen from the lampoon, uh, guys like John Hughes, um, hmm. you know, John Belushi, uh, Michael O'Donohue. Um, some of the greatest names in humor came out of the Lampoon in the 70s because those guys had complete and total creative freedom. They could do whatever they wanted and nobody 
nobody could touch them, right? Because yeah. it was such a successful magazine. It had like a circulation, I think about 5 million at one point in time. It was the number one humor magazine, Harold Ramis. You know I mean? Yeah. So many guys came out. And then yeah, well, those now guys, it's just trash. They're, they're, they're oh. censoring the right. It's like, you know, there's no point to it. The left killed it. PJ O'Rourke took over in the 80s. I, I give him credit for hiring John Hughes, but you know, it became more of a, a tits and ass uh, magazine in the eighties. And that's what mm -hmm. I remember it as. So when, when Chuck told me I want to go full national lampoon, I was like, I didn't quite get it. And then I went and I watched the documentary and I bought a bunch of old national lampoon and they went after the right as hard as they went after the left. Mm -hmm. You know, they gave equal treatment to both sides and it's so funny. And then I realized, Oh my God, these are all the people that taught my generation humor, animal house, caddyshack, Ghostbusters. I mean, on and on. It's just like, you know, you know, this is the perfect, um, you know, method to do this book. So we, we, you know, we wrote up a treatment. I submitted to, uh, to Steve Bannon and to Peter Schweizer and they liked it and they just said, cool, let's do it. And, uh, I spent most of 2015 and, um, uh, you know, leading up to the election, probably going into the spring of 2016, producing Clinton Cash. And, and you know, fortunately, I was able to pull in uh, Marvel A-listers um, and also conservatives. And, th and that was the problem. I spoke to probably 20 different artists to work on this book and nobody wanted to touch it. It was just mm. way too radioactive. And this was during the Obama years and Marvel had kind of turned sort of... Um, left of center and the editorial was starting to change generationally mm -hmm. and um editorial is everything if you don't have a relationship with an editor you're not going to get any work yeah. so they are the gatekeepers um so basically i had to put together sort of a uh a graham nolan said we're going to be like some kind of right wing artistic hit squad and i was like that <laughs> sounds pretty cool actually you know <laughs> but i got graham nolan uh legendary batman artist sergio cariello uh, uh marvel and dc guy uh who also went to the kubert school um paul Ravoche, uh, my one canadian who's um just a, who worked on forgotten man's done work for a lot of animation companies as well, uh, Warner Brothers. Um, Don Hudson, who was a Marvel and DC, Marvel bullpen guy back in the 80s in, in the studio in Manhattan, uh, was my other guy. I had a couple other guys uh, helping me out on inks. But, um, you know, between those guys and Chuck, I just had I just had just this incredible creative team. And um, I, I just got really lucky, man, because, um, you know, those guys – you know, um, you know, this was the first book that I had ever produced myself. I'd always been a colorist up until that mm -hmm. point. I had never done anything like this before, but I knew the mechanics of how you make a comic. And I just said, you know, it's, it's, it's risky business. You know, <laughs> I, I said, what the fuck? You know, if you can't say it, you can't do it. And I just figured, you know, if I do this and it's successful, it'll open more doors to me. But there is a, a very, very large probability that if I do this and it's successful or it's not, I'll probably be blacklisted yeah. from certain editors who look at this as, OK, I was a I was, I, you know, I was always an op open about my politics. You know, you know, if people asked, you mm -hmm. know, I, I didn't go around, you know, but it wasn't, yeah, you didn't put a billboard up, which basically this was. You didn't yeah. have social media during this period when I came. Yeah. So so so, you know, it was sort of like that's your private life. And you know what? As long as you turn your best work in and you turn it on time, I don't care. That was the attitude among editors. They really didn't care. And that's kind of the attitude, you know, we used to give to artists in general, actors, artists, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, they can go out and be as crazy as they want to be on the weekends, but as long as they show up on time on the set or they turn their work in, they meet their deadlines and it's, and it's great I, stuff. I, you no know, problem. I was, to your point there, I just to interrupt you real quick. I was just listening I, and I can't remember which podcast it was, unfortunately, but they were talking about how there's no more, you're not allowed to be a character anymore. You know, we had all these famous characters that'll be remembered forever. And those yeah. people are no longer permitted to exist because you get excoriated and canceled if you, if you step out of line in any way. So you will never have the Rat Pack ever again because all yeah. of those guys would have been fucking canceled, including Sammy Davis Jr. who would have been called a racist. You know? could, you get, could you get Entourage made today? I doubt. Oh, I, I doubt it. Probably too much not. toxic ma masculinity. Yeah. Too much power abuse. Right. Abuse of privilege and power and positions yeah. and relationships. All that shit. Yeah. 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 I mean. I mean. It's. It's. It's amazing how all this stuff destroys opportunities. And. Yeah. And therefore, you are. You're silencing. Uh, you're destroying creativity. You're destroying imaginations. You know. You're. You're not capitalizing on it. You know. You're not using it to its uh, highest and best level by allowing the artist to be the artist, unencumbered. 
And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and to this day, I've never had a project like Clinton cash where I was given a hundred percent freedom to uh, choose the tone and the vision of the book, which I did with Chuck and then to implement it and to allow my artists to go in and also do things. And it, for instance, I told everybody, I said, look, if you see an opening to make something funnier or to tweak something, I said, go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a there's a famous uh, a chapter head uh, that Graham Nolan did with called the Clinton blur, where we have Bill Clinton uh, uh, sort of like the flash mm -hmm. and he's zooming around. And and, um, uh, you, you know, Peter came up with the name of the Clinton blur because that's the name of the chapter. And then, you know, we're we take that and we make it funny. Right. And, and the thing that we all did with the art as well was that it's all straight. There's no it's not Mad Magazine. It's not big heads or caricatures. We did all of the art straight. Mm -hmm. And like the lampoon did. And, and basically that was so we're not fighting the humor that's in the writing. You know, you don't want the image to fight and then yeah. conflict. You want it to look authentic. You want it to look like you're just reading a normal comic book, you know, or reading some kind of satire that's 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 shot straight. And and everybody believes in it. Right. And everybody you're drawing believes it. So it so you sell it and then you you let the joke come from the writing. Mm hmm. So, but, uh, you know, Graham said, you know, Hey, I've got Clinton here and he, I got him running around. And, and he said, he said, do you mind if I put a cheeseburger in his hand? And I was just like, yes. I'm like, you know, cause that's <laughs> Phil Hartman's sketch from SNL where right. Clinton <laughs> is goes jogging with the secret service, which he was, he did in real life. And he yep. just so happened to stop by a McDonald's and he doesn't buy a thing. He just goes around to everybody's table and he's like, Hey, can I try a cheeseburger? That one's really good. <laughs> you know? Hey, is that an egg McMuffin? Yes, Mr. President, you want to have a bite? Sure. I do. You know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's kind of one of those things where I, I, I told my artists, look, we, we have creative freedom here. We're never going to get another opportunity. These guys don't know how to make comics. They have basically mm -hmm. given us this, this project, you know, I, I've got this and, you know, we have f full reign. And so, you know, my creative team and I, you know, we ran around like wild Indians for, you know, basically about a year making this book. And, um, you know, but, but again, I knew that, you know, like I said before, you know, there was going to be a cost here and hopefully that it will be successful. And, and on top of that, it would open up new doors and new opportunities, um, you know, to where I wouldn't have to worry about, um, Marvel and DC seeing what I did. Um, it's not only what I did, but the fact that it was successful. That's right, what yeah. really burned them. And, um, you know, so so we cranked this thing out. Um, it came out in the summer of 2016, right before the election. Um, Peter and I did uh, a Fox and Friends segment, a full segment to 20 million people or whoever, however many people watch that. And uh, fortunately, they were able to take pages and blow them up like five feet tall. Mm. So we're on the big Fox set and they've got these huge blown up pieces of artwork. So you could really see them because, you know, graphic novels, uh, you know, any type of visual storytelling, the artwork always comes first. That's the hook. You know, you've got to have a great visual in order to hook somebody and then they want to flip through it or they want to play it and they want to watch it, whatever it is. I don't care if it's movies, comics, animation. If it doesn't look good, nobody's going to give a shit. Nobody's going to want to watch it. Mm -hmm. um so we're able to have all the artwork there some you know some really great stuff that they picked out and um i was so nervous um that was my first live tv you know it's like trial by fire um but when i got on the plane to come home later in the day um my my girlfriend uh texted me and said your book sold out oh wow 24 Damn, hours that was fast <laughs> yeah and she said you know she said you know the New York Times bestseller list really isn't based whatever al algorithm. Oh yeah, metric. it's complete. It's completely rigged. Yeah, well, it's ridiculous. Well, it used to be. Uh, I, I believe it's rigged, but but we you know we we slipped through the cracks. You know, mm. um, I, I I think at the time it was kind of like the volume of which you sold in a certain period of time. So to sell out however many copies that Regnery had on on you know that day, probably you know in less than twenty four hours we we mm. rocketed to number one. And we were number one in the New York Times bestseller list for uh, about a month. And oh. what, what, what was number one? What did we kick out of the number one spot? Batman the Killing Joke, which had been there for two years. Oh, wow. So, you know, to say that Marvel and DC didn't know what I was doing, they knew exactly what I was doing. And they're like, they were probably like, who's Brett Smith? And somebody's like, right. he's one of our colorists. <laughs> and then they're like, how did you get Chuck Dixon and Graham Nolan <laughs> and all these other guys to do this? Yeah. You know, to not only do it, but put their name on it, you know, because 
um, Clinton Cash is, you know, it's all of Peter's exhaustive reporting and, uh, and information. Um, you know, and it's like, I remember when I, uh, when we did this, I asked Peter, I said, look, I read your book. I find it very dry. It's very boring. It's, it's very <laughs> bland. I feel like I needed a highlighter. And he's like, yes, I know. That's why we hired you to make a much more enjoyable, <laughs> entertaining, memorable version. And he said, you did that. You know, we mm -hmm. had breakfast after the, the, the Fox and Friends thing. And I asked him, I said, can I, can I use these words to describe the, the original book and why we did this? He's like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. He's like, he's like, he's like the policy wonks love my stuff, but we want to expand to a younger audience. We want to get millennials to read Clinton Cash. We want people that love comics and graphic novels to be interested in this. And this is how you do it. You know, you go out and you spare no expense. And, you know, credit to Bannon and Peter Schweizer. They gave me a great budget. I told them what I wanted and what I needed to get all of these Marvel and DC artists. And I told them, I said, look, I'm not going to do this unless you give me this much a page so I can go out and hire the best. Because I am mm -hmm. not going to stick my neck out of the line and create yeah. something for you that doesn't kick ass and look great. Because if it's the last thing I do, it's going to look great. It's going to look perfect. You know, um, and... I'd say 99% of the book is perfect. Uh, it's, you know, the lawyers had us go in and change some things. Right. Yeah. Um, a couple things just to, on yeah, the back some end, but, but otherwise, you know, um, the quality, you know, uh, Regnery did a great job as well. They published it. They're the ones that came up with the idea to do a paper overboard cover. It's about a hundred pages. And then you put that poor man soft or hard cover on there. It's just, it's just a cover without a dust jacket, basically. Mm. Um, you know, we were able to, you know, get away with, uh, I think 1999 and it makes it chunky and, you know, you can stick something like that on your bookshelf. You know, it's not yeah. like a floppy, you know, and, and that's the cool thing about graphic novels is I think that, you know, it's sort of like the, the adults comic book in a lot oh, of Oh, totally. Ways. Yeah. I got, yeah I, got a, I have a couple on my shelves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you know, part of, part of Gen X and early millennials, you know, you know, what, what holds our culture together is pop culture. Um, you know, the, the boomers have Vietnam and they have women's suffrage and they have, you know, uh, Watergate and they have all of these political world things. That's what holds. They have JFK. You know, mm -hmm. that's the stuff that holds the boomers together. But for Gen X, it is the Saturday morning cartoons. It's the movies. It's the TV shows. You know, it, it's all that stuff because that that's all we really had, you know. Right. That, you know, and, and that's it. maybe until, you know, Gulf War. Right. But by then we were all we were all adults. Exactly. Right. And even and even then it was it was more entertainment than it was an active wasn't it you know, engagement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really was. It was it, yeah. it was it was the first war that was really uh, entertainment. It was televised the entire yeah. thing. I remember every night watching the updates and it was like, we're kicking their asses. Well, the all, night, right. remember yeah. the night, all the night vision was brand new and nobody yeah. had ever really seen that before. And to see like that, the footage of the fighter planes going in and all that anti-aircraft fire going. Yeah. In. Bright. And, bright those, yeah. and those stealths just just moved, just just cruised right along. You know, they, they yep. didn't even know they were there. But I mean, that it, it was it was almost like um, it, it was almost like a video game or something. It, it, because, and, yeah, and, I mean, legitimately. It, and the fact that we went in and just absolutely just crushed them was the other. Yeah, the, less than 5,000 losses. And, and, you know, most of those, I think, were from the fire. Yeah. yeah I mean, it was, an, it was an unbelievable victory. And yeah. But to your point, it wasn't something that even as a kid or, you know, and I was very young when it was going on. I can't remember exactly, you know, how old I was at the time. I'm not going to do mm -hmm. the math. But but we really did bond around, as you said, the yeah. entertainment culture. Now that brings me to the next question here as we kind of wrap the show up is so, so this, you know, Clinton cash happened, obviously they saw it. Um, you know, and tell me a little bit how, where that left you as far as relationship with the industry right. and where you, you know, where do you want to go now? I mean, and we talked about some of these independents. Are you thinking about, doing anything on your own independently or yeah, approaching a Ripaverse yeah. or a, or a cyber frog and trying to, to do something with them. Yeah. You know, is this, where, where are things at right now? Um, you know, so, so Clinton cash was, you know, you know, very successful, sold great. A lot of millennials bought it, um, which, which was, which kind of amazed me. Um, uh, but they did, they liked it because, because, you know, it's the medium is the message, you know, and mm -hmm. you, you, you know, uh, it, you know, the, the format was so much about what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, which we did. Um, unfortunately, after that, Marvel and all the editors that I worked for at Marvel and DC wouldn't speak to me. You know, emails just yeah. never answered. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I just kind of figured, well, that's that was the risk. You know, that was the risk. I got a successful book out of it. I created something. I packaged a book for a client. I had never done that before. So I expanded my skill set. 
-hmm. I had met people that I had never met before. I developed relationships with them, like Chuck Dixon. You know, these guys that I grew up reading and admiring I, uh, were working for me. So I figured I can do this for other people. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that's kind of because there wasn't anything else for me really to do. You know, it's, um, you know, I could have gone back into advertising, um, but it was, you know, it was kind of slow at the time. Um, and I just remember kind of looking around, sort of trying to find other clients to package books for. And um, I've packaged um, uh, seven so far. So after mm -hmm. Clinton Cash, we did Thump the First Bundred Days, which was mm -hmm. a children's book. Satirical children. I always tell people it's kind of a Pixar book. It appeals to adults and children, but it was a, a retelling of the 2016 election with uh, Donald Trump as a cute, lovable, fluffy bunny named Thump, mm -hmm. and every, everybody kind of basically had uh, animal alter egos, and it's it's all done in a very soft watercolor, um, you know, kind of um, uh, kind of yeah, like uh, a Peter Rabbit, Peter Rabbit, uh, yeah, 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 concept, of, yeah, Ill illustrated, and. Um, you know, it was it was meant to be um, obviously satirical. I, whenever I do politics, it's always with satire. Mm -hmm. um, after you know, and, and um, after uh, Clinton Cash, we did Thump. Uh, I had some artists that came to me with the character, mm -hmm. just Thump. You know, this bunny with this little blue suit and a tie and a quaffed of blonde hair, and I was just like, "That's brilliant!" And I'm going to make <laughs> I'm going to make a stuffed animal out of that. We're going to have a yeah. book, but I'm going to make a stuffed animal out of that, which we did. Um, and but. Uh, you know, I was able to use a lot of the connections and the relationships that I developed through Clinton Cash to help promote them. Uh, it was also an election year, so that helped. Mm -hmm. And and things were hot. Uh, anything Trump was very hot. So that went Amazon number one, uh, uh -huh. which, which, which gave me two Amazon number ones. Uh, Clinton Cash got within five spots of Harry Potter on Amazon. Damn. That's that's how well that book did. So it's like, you know, right out of the gate, I, I got a number one on Amazon and New York Times, and I just kind of figured... I've got to, I've got to leverage this in order to continue on doing commercial art. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to go work at some corporation or something managing mm -hmm. people, you know, which isn't the worst thing in the world. But at the same time, I just felt like, you know, I want to stay in the game. And there's very few artists at the time that were doing comics, um, you know, right, you know, right of center comics or political satire. So Thump came out that did well. And then we ended up doing a crowdfund for uh, Trump Space Force. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and publishing it through Antarctic Press, which is a, a small publisher out of San Antonio. They've been around for since the 80s. They brought a lot of manga to uh, uh, to America in the 80s and the 90s, funny enough. Um, now manga is outselling American comics like four to one. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's a very different, uh, you know, industry. But we, uh, uh, someone uh, approached me, um, uh, my friend Richard Meyer, who had a YouTube channel called Diversity in Comics, um, uh, after Thump and said, I'm doing this book and I'm crowdfunding. It's called Jawbreakers, Lost Souls. And, um, you know, he said, I've got this YouTube channel where I review comics. And, um, and he had, you know, I think 10,000 subs or something like that at the time. Now I think he's like, in, he's like 50 or 60. I mean, it's, it's, he's grown, grown the channel quite a bit. Now it's called Comics Matter with Ya Boy Zach. <laughs> and, uh, that's what all the fans call him. They call him Zach for some reason. But um, I have been Facebook friends with him for, for years on Facebook. And he was just a Marine, a buddy who I knew served, was in the Marines. And he was really into comics. And we would talk every once in a while. But he started this YouTube channel, which just exploded. Because he would basically call out all of the woke SJW mm -hmm. crap that ha had been happening in, in Marvel and DC. And this is back in like 2018. And basically, he just said, um, I've got John Malin, who's a Marvel guy, uh, worked on Thunderbolts. And... Um, I'm doing kind of uh, sort of an A-team sort of story, you know, but these are my characters. They're brand new. So I want to I give people something new. So I said, that sounds interesting. You know, um, let me take a look at the artwork. I took a look at the artwork. I loved it. I thought it was great. I, I love the whole concept. They, they're mercenaries, basically. Mm -hmm. um, each one uh, very different. And, and, you know, so you got like the black guy. You've got the, um, you know, who's sort of like the, the heavy sort of Mr. T. You've got... Um, um, uh, one guy who's, who's a mute sort of, but it, it, it's like a weapons expert. So he's sort of snake eyes. And then you had like the lead guy, um, you know, who was sort of like Flint cause he has his little mustache and, and black hair. Um, uh, but, but I, I just figured, um, this is cool and new, and this exposes me to a brand new audience of, uh, comic buyers and it's indie. So we can kind of get away with whatever we want to get away with. And, um, I was brand new to the whole kickstarting thing. I, I, I didn't really know anything about it. So uh, the campaign, when I, when I came on, they had like five pages done. Um, so I went and I colored them and we posted those and 
I remember the thing went from like, you know, like a ten, twenty thousand dollar campaign to like a fifty thousand dollar campaign within days. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that, you know, you know, showing that finished art and having it look equal to or greater than would come out of Marvel or DC um, brought a lot of authenticity to mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the project. And I think that's what people want more than anything. They, they want to know that something entertainment is authentic, you know, and it's got to look and feel that way. You know, if it's done in a way that's cheap or half-assed b-movie type stuff you know a lot of stuff that you know christian producers do right, with yeah. the exception of the chosen which looks beautiful and that's mm. all crowdfunded but you know up until that point you know you sort of had these kurt cameron sort of b-movie bullshit which just you just know the look of and when you see him right it's like, eh, you know it's not so it's like you know if we're going to create we need to be equal to or greater what the left would create you know um and we were able to do that and um i remember um this campaign, for, you know, Zach was already sort of a um, controversial figure at Marvel. The editors knew about his channel. They didn't like him. Um, and some of the other comic professionals out there didn't like him. They still don't like him. But mm -hmm. a guy named Mark Wade, who is a, a, a talented writer at Marvel and DC, wrote a book called Kingdom Come, which is probably one of my favorites, um, uh, interfered at the time of the campaign. We were trying to get it published through Antarctic. Mark called Antarctic and uh, basically said, don't do that. You know, these are bad guys. <laughs> and um, shit. <laughs> that controversy got out into the public and because um, Mark was open about it. And um, uh, Zach was still on Twitter at the time. So that summer of 18, when Mark Wade interfered in the book, like overnight, we went to 100,000. So, and then yeah, perfect PR campaign four, working the opposite. Yeah, five. I mean, it, it just it just went absolutely apeshit. And we ended up with probably somewhere around 10 to maybe 12,000 um, uh, customers, you know, guys that, you know, that, that, that pre-ordered it, that backed the, the campaign. And um, I remember, you know, just working on this thing over that summer and just thinking to myself, you know, I, I can't believe there's that many people that would be, you know, that, that are that thirsty, you know, and just, you know, starving for something new and authentic and cool. Um, I mean, they'd only seen five, six pages of this book, mm -hmm. but they were convinced that this is something they wanted to do. Plus, you know, Mark basically kind of put everybody into camps, mm -hmm. you know, um, and all that bad publicity was great publicity. Um, and it just put all these eyeballs on it that normally would have. It's like the Streisand effect, I think is what they call it. Mm -hmm. um, it was just it was just kind of perfect. It was very much like what Trump does. You know, he takes like bad PR and just like spins it into gold, or at least he did back then. Um, so this campaign, I think peaked out around a million bucks. And um, uh, at the same time uh, that this campaign, I think uh, I think it was around the same time, Ethan Van Skyver, uh, you know, very famous yep. and talented DC artist, left DC and uh, uh, brought back a character they created back in the 90s called Cyberfrog. And Cyberfrog was a huge campaign. That went over a million bucks as well. So it's like, you know, a lot of the eyeballs that were on Jawbreakers then you know, because we were all promoting each other on Twitter in the summer of 2018. There was like, um, there was uh, also Mitch, Mitch Breitweiser, Allegiant Arts. They had uh, Red Rooster. Um, there was a bunch of, and then there was a bunch of smaller creators as well, kind of underneath these bigger books that were all sort of in the, uh, under the moniker of Comicsgate. Mm -hmm. And um, Comicsgate still exists today. And, and a lot of the same creators are there and they're, you know, on their third or fourth campaigns of these books. And they're just, you know, growing their numbers, um, growing their audience. A lot of these guys all have YouTube channels and uh, kind of, you know, uh, cultivate that audience there and turn those listeners into customers. Ethan's doing toys. Yeah, uh, I just saw it. So it's got a whole, toys. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 so teen, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to me, and, and, and mm -hmm. I love it. I think it's great <laughs> um, because it just reminds me of that in that sense, uh, something that's um, just just sort of perfect for for. for adults and young kids, you know, I mean, young boys and cyber frog, it's just kind of perfect. Um, but I just think, um, the, the indie market, I, I had no, I, I had no expectations. So I really didn't know what I was getting into, but to see it as strong as it is, was, uh, really encouraging to me. And so, you know, I, we've crowdfunded some stuff. I've worked with some clients where I packaged things like black tide rising. Um, I also did a graphic novel called Blood for some Hollywood guys. Some of these things have been uh, privately financed. Some of them have been crowdfunded. Um, I did I did a book with Jack Posobiec called Agent Poso, where we crowdfunded. We turned him into kind of a James Bond, Jason Bourne character. 
in a dystopian future where Chelsea, Chelsea Clinton is, is president. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of like, you know, dipping back into my GI Joe heritage, um, yeah. you know, you know, you know, as far as like the storyline and like the gadgets and the ships and the cars, it was fun. Um, but, um, cause I colored GI Joe for like two years at, uh, back in the early two thousands. And, um, it w when it was with devil's do publishing and, and we were trying to go for sort of like a, you know, tap into what the cartoon did, but also kind of modernize it in, mm. in a way, um, and make Cobra like a real terrorist organization, <laughs> you know, you know, where, you know, and, and make him really dangerous. Instead of um, Cobra Commander, you had George Soros in a mask. Right, right. Yeah, there were no <laughs> parachutes Schwab. that would open up. You know, when they when the planes would explode. You know, and, yeah, and all, yeah. And all stuff. So it was it was a little bit more kind of like the Marvel stuff. I and mean, people mm. died in the Marvel comic GI Joes, um, which you could never get away with in the animation. But um, but you know, um, the indie market I think is very strong. Um, you know, Marvel and DC are just putting out a lot of garbage, which helps the indie market because it just drives people to it because it's the only place you're going to find. Uh, you know, not only good stories, but I think new stories. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I just started coloring for Eric July. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, probably yeah. about six months, uh, four or five months ago. Okay. Um, I didn't realize you were already working with Eric. That's cool to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he raised $3 million, $3.5 million off his first yeah. book. I know. I know, man. It's amazing. That's you know, why he won't get back to me on Twitter. Tell him, to, tell him to answer my damn tweets. I'll, I'll mention it to him. No, I will. <laughs> yeah, you know, I want he's, to have him, I, he's been on the show years ago. I want to have him back on and talk about it. Uh, no, absolutely. You should. Cause he's, he's got a great story to tell. Um, I've been doing all the covers. Um, you know, oh, he's, nice. got, he's got three or four books that he's got in the pipeline. He's hired Chuck Dixon. Oh, sweet. He hired, hired some uh, girls who worked at DC, the Soska sisters. I, I, I was mm -hmm. not familiar with them, but that doesn't mean anything. Cause I haven't, been reading comics in a while, not Marvel and DC stuff really. But um, yeah, I mean, Eric's going out and hiring kind of like what I did was, you know, go out and, and, and hire a great team, surround yourself with, with excellence. And um, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of, I, I remember listening to Clint Eastwood talk about shooting movies and, and he just said, I just go out and hire, you know, the best people possible. I surround myself with great people and then I take all the credit, you know, it's great. You know? <laughs> and, and there is something to be said about that. I mean, you, you know, when you put together a creative team, you got to obviously put together people that can get along and also want to work together and, you know, and, and produce a, a good product. Um, cause it's, cause it's not as simple as just saying, oh, I'm going to go get the best, you know, you, mm -hmm. you've got to kind of got to put together personalities that you can work with and that they can work with you and everybody, you know, works as a team because it is a, uh, assembly line uh, type of production and similar to movies where, you know, you have a writer, you have an artist, a colorist and a letterer, the guy that's the word balloons. And, um, and you just kind of, you, you move through that assembly line and you end up with a finished page. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it's an art form like anything and, and you're not exactly sure what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of part of the fun because a lot of the times uh, if, if you have a good creative team, then the artwork that you're getting in, daily or weekly is exceeding your expectations. You know, it's coming in better than what I saw in my head when I read that script and started thinking about the visuals and what Graham's going to do with this and what Sergio's going to do with this. So, and I, I typically go back to the same guys. Chuck has been my writer on all my books. Mm -hmm. um, we just have a shorthand and, and I, you know, I just know I'm going to get something fantastic and, uh, and fun and something that like the nine-year-old me you know, would have just been over the moon for, you mm -hmm. know, and I think, and that's kind of how I feel projects these days and sort of look at stuff. I just say to myself, is this something I would want to buy? Is this something that I, that the, the nine-year-old in me would want to buy? Um, so, and now I am, you know, doing work for Eric and I'm doing a, a book with uh, uh, Chuck called Mad Dogs, which is sort of like Dirty Harry meets the Dirty Dozen set in oh, the nice. 80s, uh, vigilante cop type, type book. Um, and then I'm doing a, uh, Chuck and my girlfriend and I uh, and a guy, uh, an artist named Butch Geis are working on a children's book because that's my my next thing. I'm going to shift to uh, the uh, early readers, six to nine boys, specifically stuff for boys. And <laughs> um, it's it's going to be awesome. So once I got some finished artwork, I will show you because. Yeah, I, I'd love to see Well, that, you're man. a dad. I'm not. Yeah. So, I, so and I, I actually I actually wrote a children's book. I'm trying to to get, you know, manage representation for right now. So it's just funny. It's, it's, it's a great industry because it's much bigger than comics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think that we need to get, you know, like the left, we, we need to get to the kids young, man. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, you know, we started this off by talking about cartoons and comics and stuff that we read when we were young. Mm -hmm. And, and that's part of why we turned out the way we turned, we turned out, you know, I mean, would you be the man today 
if you hadn't seen Red Dawn. I mean, honestly, I, I think about that <laughs> fairly often or like the G.I. Joe stuff we're talking about. You know, yeah. it's that it, it's that stand up, do the right thing and and fight, fight for it, what, what you would call toxic in. masculinity. Yeah. Fight for what you believe in. Stand yeah. up for what's right. Protect the people around you, whether you know them or not. You know, you, you do the right thing. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, we need more of that, man. So, yeah, yeah I'd love I to see that stuff when you get it done. Yeah, I, I think I think that's um, um, I, I think I think there's a vacuum there that, that, that can be filled. And um, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing it. But, I, I, you know, it's like it's like with you and other guys that, that, that are uh, I'm friends with who are dads. You know, I'm kind of like, OK, you know, I'm, I'm going to send you this stuff and show mm -hmm. it to your kid. You know, I want to get yeah, for sure. a little do a little A.V. testing here, see, see what happens. But I, I think it'll be awesome. Um, and, um, you know, I just continue to do the, the coloring as well. Um, and then packaging books for clients, but that's sort of where I ended up, um, you know, on, on the other end of Clinton cash. So it was, um, I, I don't regret it. Sometimes I'm frustrated because the right does not invest mm. in, in pop culture like the left does. I mean, yeah. not even close, yeah. um, you know, and, and the right doesn't invest in really much of anything. I mean, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have these problems with DEI and, 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 you know, ESG, if there were people on the right that owned banks. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> it I is mean, odd that we don't have. I mean, yeah, I, I, Andrew Breitbart, you know, said a long time ago, he said, obviously, politics is downstream from culture, which is 100 percent true. Mm. Um, but but, you know, you, you poison the culture. It will run downstream into politics, into education, into film and into, into everything. But but he said a long time ago, he said, you know, you know, every four to six years, you know, we, we hear the clarion call from, uh, you know, all the familiar voices, you know, that the billionaires have got to pour all this money into this state or this this race or into 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 this pack. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, why didn't we invest in a movie studio 20 years ago? Exactly. Why didn't we invest in a TV studio? Why aren't we out there, you know, creating art within all mediums in order to not only create jobs for people who are like-minded, but moreover, why are we not creating entertainment? Uh, and I don't care whether it's animation, comic books, or film, which um, reflects and affirms that which is good about mm -hmm. America. Right. You know, and, and I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, how do these people call themselves conservatives? What do they conserve other than their money? You know, yeah. these billionaires, you know, they pour money into white papers, into political consultants. and Which just, which nobody, which again, with nobody ever reads, you know, other creating, than maybe. You're creating in the divide, you know, yeah. and, and what you and I are talking about is creating outside the divide, hitting that mm -hmm. big blue ocean, you know, hitting that audience that watches Yellowstone. Um, a lot of them are normies, man. A lot of them aren't even politically motivated or minded, well, you know. And, and that's the point, right? And I bitched about this a lot. We were talking about the Kirk Cameron stuff. I, you know, you can make content that still is in the line, would you say, would be libertarian or conservative, you know, and it can still be good. It doesn't have to hit people over the fucking head all the time with the message. And I think that's what get lost, too, is that yeah. when people get hit over the head, and this is why the leftist comics are failing and people are trying to find something different. They know they're being sold something and nobody likes being sold something with you can tangibly feel it. Yes. You don't have to put the message in that strongly. It can be an authentic story with good people doing good things. Yeah. And that's enough without having to you know, tell people or go on this you know, diatribe people, within the comic. People like to come to conclusions on their own. Exactly. And you can, and fortunately enough, there's no better medium than storytelling and visual storytelling mm -hmm. to help them come to conclusions on their own, or at least they think they are. Right. But, but you do that through the beats of the story and the journey right. and the arc of your characters. And when you when you've reached that conclusion, they get it. And, and, and they not only get it, but they, they love it. It feeds their soul. And then, then they want to wear that brand forever. Right. And they want to rewatch it over and over again and pass it down to their kids like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so it's like, you know, it, this isn't rocket science. You know, I mean, there's so many brands that we grew up with, which are, which are kind of, um, uh, you, you know, iconic in, in the sense that they're American. Right. Um, you can still do that. It's just, you know, do people want to, does anybody want to do that? You know, and, and when we do get it, it's kind of this reactionary thing, mm -hmm. like Daily Wire doing uh, razors and candy bars. I mean, okay, fine. You know, you get a dunk on somebody and you provide like an alternative for what, I don't know, a couple months. But it's like, you know, why aren't we playing the long game from the standpoint mm -hmm. of, 
you know, why am I putting out one or two graphic novels a year when I could be putting out five or 10 and putting, right. and putting to work a bunch of people who are right now working behind enemy lines, uh, uh, terrified to speak up because they know that it's going to destroy their family and they're not going to be able to meet their mortgage. So they keep their mouth shut. They're a closeted conservative. I know so many of them at Marvel and DC uh, in Hollywood, you know, they wouldn't have to keep their mouth shut. They wouldn't have to be put in this position if there was work for them on the other mm -hmm. side, you know, so I'd love to see the billionaires shift their money from the think tanks, you know, and all these, you know, these pseudo intellectuals who just write white papers for themselves, you know, to invest in the arts, you know, yeah. and, and I, and I tell conservative parents, you know, get your kid in the arts. You know, yeah, exactly. It's, it's the other way around. They're like, oh, I, you know, I don't want them to get some worthless degree. It's like, yeah, but they need to be teachers. They need to be artists because those are the people who create the culture, you know? Mm -hmm. Precisely. Well, so. I think that the fact that now there's proof of concept out there between Clinton Cash, between the other books that you're working on, between Ripaverse and what Ethan's working on, I think now there's, it's going to be a lot easier to fundraise, to get somebody to buy oh, yeah. into the concept because, the, you know, and especially seeing the way that we have been divided and seeing the way that people are moving away from this extreme leftism. And as you said, there are vastly more. I mean, in LA, just talking to parents, I know where people are moving. You can feel yeah. it. It's a tangible move away from the left because they've just pushed too far. And maybe they haven't pushed too far. They pushed too far too fast for most people because they they've been a little do. bit more clever about this in the past. You know, and now they've they overplayed have. their hand. You know, uh, uh, Robert Davi likes to say that, you know, instead of being preachy, you know, like we're mm -hmm. talking about, you can't, you know, you know, you know, you can't shoehorn this stuff in. Uh, he always yeah. says the message has to be in the ravioli. It's got to be yeah. baked in. Right. And that's what you were talking about. Exactly. The left used to do that. They don't do that anymore. Now it's just no. all on the surface. It used to be very covert, their messaging. Now it's not. Now it's just full blown in your face. You know, and I don't know what happened if they just lost all their good writers or like, you know, what, like what happened, you know, because they're uh, far I don't less know either, than they used to be. But I think that's a blessing. I think it's hubris more than anything. I think that it's just kind of like you will agree with me or you're a racist, you're a Nazi, you're a white. Uh, social media, I think, has really has, I think, made them lose not only the fear because they, they provided themselves with an echo chamber. That's a false echo chamber of of approval and of the moral superiority, which is not the reality. So I think it's social right. media giving them, you know, removing these these breaks they used to have to pump and giving them a false sense of confidence in what what people believe. I yeah. think that's really led to the majority of this. And it's just, I, a, you know, thank God in a way, as, as evil as social media is to yeah. leading to the rise in a lot of what we're seeing, it's also a blessing because it's really exposed people and it's allowing them to show their cards. I, but I'm with you. I, I think they push too hard. I think the pendulum is finally, you know, I, I've, I've said it in the last couple of years, I think the pendulum's finally gonna swing and it never quite gets there. But right. I, I think we sort of, I think through COVID, the lockdowns, I think this trans stuff, um, I, I think it's finally, it's weirded the normies out. Mm -hmm. And when you weird out the normies, that's when, that's when you got to be really worried yeah. about, about your future, you know, and, and your and as not only as a party, but also as a brand. I, I mean, I don't know how Bud Light comes back from this other than to, I know how they come back from it, but I'm just, I just don't know if there's anybody there who's willing to um, take ownership and say we effed up and, and, and we've got to say it. Um, yeah, well, that's that's what really what they're missing. You know, I work in, in communications and I've been saying that forever is you need to acknowledge the mistake and that everything they've done since then has been patronizing, has been the absolute right. Even though up to this weekend, these camo cans, <laughs> look, people aren't that stupid, man. They're not going to buy your product because you slap camo on it or say it's for first responders. Or they got the Harley Davidson ad coming out. Oh, here. God, I know. Even that. Yeah. And again, it's it, insulting. It's just like, hey, dummy, hey, hillbillies. We think right. that you like motorcycles. We put a motorcycle on the can. Cool. We we, we bros again. You're like, no, dickheads. We're not bros again. It's just it, they do everything wrong. But we're, we're, phone, we're already bro. almost. Yeah, yeah, right. We're uh, at ninety minutes. This episode's gone way longer than usual. So let's Sorry. wrap up here. Oh no, man, it's good. We'll we'll you know we'll we'll have you back on again, obviously, and, and talk some more. So, cool. uh, Brett, where can everybody find you? Where can they go to support what you're working on? And and obviously, uh, you know, tell them your website. So if people want to hire you or collaborate with you, they can find sure. you easily uh twitter you can find me at brett r smith 76 um uh my my website is just brs and the numbers 76.com you can check me out there i've got a link to that in my bio on my twitter mm -hmm. page i'll, I'll link to that in the show notes as well everybody cool cool yeah that's the best place um you can message me there if you want to hire me um and um 
I, I usually keep people updated on my Twitter page as far as like new projects and stuff like that. So everything, the, the children's book, I'm going to, um, uh, we're doing that on our own. We're financing that on our own. And, um, I think we're going to, we're either going to self publish or we're going to publish, uh, through a friend of mine's, uh, publishing house. So w once that's kind of gets ramped up, I'll send you some stuff to check out, yeah, for and, sure, man. Uh, you know, and we can, we can have that episode, but, um, but yeah, that's the best place, but, uh, thanks so much, man. This is a blast. Oh, for sure. Great chatting with you. Always, you know, it always goes long. It typically, uh, <laughs> we always talk like way longer after the episode ends, you know, when it I was on your, your like show it, too. It never seems yeah, like Yeah, I know. It. No, that's good. That's a side of good conversation. All right, guys. Yeah. Well, thank you all for tuning in to Mean Age Daydream with Brett Smith. From me, from Brett, from the Lions of Liberty Network, and from Mean Age Daydream, keep those electric eyes on me, babe, and keep that ray gun to my head.